So as our as the introductions shared, I am the author of a recent book called Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World. And I will talk a little bit about the book, but I also want to uh, kind of rush us fast forward to the very, very, very present moment and have a conversation about what some of the ideas about a feminicity have to say or can speak to in the present moment. So I'm coming to you today from what is currently known as Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq and Wolastikai people where we are governed by treaties of peace and friendship. My institution is Mount Allison University, which is uh, kind of the Canadian version of a small liberal arts college. This book was written uh, well before COVID and it's been fascinating to me to be talking about this work in a time when uh, so many of these ideas, suddenly people are like, oh yes, these things are, are a problem or this is something that we should be talking about. And for many of us, it's like, well, yes, we, <laughs> we should have been talking about these things all along. So I just want to acknowledge right away that I am definitely not the first person to say either anything that is <laughs> in the book or the things that I'm going to share with you in our conversation today. So this book, just to give you a tiny little sense of what it's what it's about, it's meant for a wide audience of people. And my vision was to sort of connect based on um, personal experience of uh, living in the city with all of the tensions that that brings for those who are women. And to explore from both the perspective of, you know, what are the opportunities offered by the city and what are also the constraints. And again, I think in the present moment, we're really, those, those things have been really sharpened for us in um, some quite, I think, quite visceral ways. So the good news is that people seem to be open to hearing some of these uh, feminist, anti-racist, decolonial critiques of disciplines like planning, urban design, and architecture. And, you know, I'm hoping that this is a moment where some of those themes in the book about the ways in which the spaces around us are not just stages where our social relations play out, but that they are um, also active participants in these kinds of social relations and that they are not sort of God-given, right? We can change the built environment and we can set it up to support the kinds of societies that we want to have. All right, as I said, I just wanna really launch us right into the present moment. So I'm gonna share a couple of uh, headlines from recently. So first one, her kid had a stuffy nose. Now hers is one of many Ontario families in COVID-19 testing limbo. So this is a story about families where their kids are going back to school. They have a runny nose, which is like 80% of children all the time, right? But they have to come out of school, be tested for COVID, and there's a long backlog because of course, uh, there's a massive uptick in this now that schools have gone back in. And the thing to note is that every story that I've seen about this, um, it's always the mother who has had to stay home from work while they're waiting for their child to be tested and to get the results of that test. Here's another one again from Canada, from Toronto, which is my home city. Um, overcrowded buses worry commuters as COVID-19 cases rise and weather turns colder. The TTC acknowledges physical distancing is not possible on some routes. And these routes that the uh, Transit Commission is talking about are the routes, the, the primarily bus routes that run through what we call the inner suburbs in Toronto, which are lower income, racialized, recent immigrant neighborhoods where the kind of people who do the essential labor and the underpaid care labor of the city are commuting from. So they are uniquely and disproportionately exposed to the risks of having to take overcrowded public transit with a system that seems to say there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, a couple of others, parents who work in childcare are trapped in an unsustainable system. So this piece points out that people who provide childcare, paid childcare, don't make enough money to put their own children in childcare, right? So this becomes this, uh, catch-22 kind of situation. And, you know, no surprise to many people, the pandemic has exacerbated the gender divide in household 
labor, where we have a situation where in many families, uh, heterosexual families, the male partner is still not doing their full share of the work. So I wanted to share these and to give you a couple of Canadian headlines as well to really illustrate for uh, maybe a primarily American but also international audience that even in a country where we say that the pandemic has been handled relatively well, that these kinds of gendered and racialized care labor problems persist. And what this suggests to me is that there are a whole lot of assumptions still underlying the way that we set up our cities and our homes and a whole lot of being okay with relying on a very shaky, unequal and exploitative status quo that some people are only just realizing is kind of a problem. So COVID did not create these problems, right? Not, not at all. <laughs> these things go back a very, very long time. But the question we can ask is, you know, where do we find communities of care and what are our cities doing or not doing that could be making a difference here? So I argue both in the book and in all of my kind of ranting about these topics over the last few months that cities have been long been content pretty much to assume that the provisioning of care will happen in the home and will be largely unpaid. So we might ask, you know, how active have cities been in creating or lobbying for affordable or free childcare? Um, have they been just waiting for national governments to maybe possibly sort of do something about this, which is a recent promise of our uh, federal government here in Canada? How many cities have actively and positively responded to calls for living wages and higher minimum wages? which would impact primarily women, people of color, and those in all of these underpaid service and caregiving work jobs, some of which suddenly got called essential labor. So it's clear to many of us that we are in a care crisis and in some ways it's nothing new, but the COVID situation has really amplified it in many ways. So I'm just gonna put uh, a few points up here for us to think about, right? The first one that care work has remained, and I would argue quite deliberately <laughs> hidden and invisible within the private family home. This is a status quo that works quite well for some people, right? So there's been, I would say, relatively little interest in actually um, changing this status quo. The second point um, is that in many households, men still do not do a full share of childcare and housework. Perhaps even more importantly, public care work. So that is work that uh, is paid and is done in what we call the public sphere has still been underpaid, undervalued and even stigmatized and therefore has fallen to the most marginalized groups in society, people of color, recent immigrants, and we've certainly seen that those are the groups who have been most disproportionately exposed to the harms of COVID in part because of the care work that they do. So again, even here in you know, this wonderful paradise of Canada, people who worked, uh, especially in places like long-term care homes who are primarily recent immigrants, low-income people, women, even refugees um, have had higher rates of COVID infection and, and deaths than other people in the population. And, and I think we're also seeing that, that some very problematic assumptions about who does care work really do run rampant in policymaking in every sector because it seems to have come as a surprise to our governments that it is that like you can't reopen the economy without school and childcare. And it's sort of like, oh, right, yes, that's, that's going to be a problem. So to me, what that illustrates is that we have been for a very long time kind of okay to rest on the assumption that care work, even if it's being done unequally and kind of exploitatively, it's okay, it's being done in the home without really realizing um, those other aspects of our social system that are that really allow the economy to run. And when you take some of those pieces away, whether it's paid childcare or schooling, then the whole house of cards starts to come crumbling down. So then what does it mean to envision a feminist city, or as I see here, a, a potentially a more feminist city as a kind of aspirational, both concept and hopefully real place? 
So to me, we can also maybe think about some new assumptions and starting points. And, and let me just say right here that when I was planning this talk, I was thinking, oh, geez, this is Columbia. I, I, I better have some smart things to say, right? I better bring some theory to this conversation, better really show that I know what I'm talking about. But ultimately, I have just kept coming back to points that seem so wildly obvious and yet seem to require rearticulation again and again and again. So I apologize if this like doesn't seem smart, but I don't know what else to do except to keep talking about these things in the hope that we can drive some of these points home to the places that really need to hear them. And that would include people in urban planning, design and architecture pro uh, professions, policymakers, politicians, and even just, you know, us everyday people as well. Okay, so the first one that I put up here is, is the idea that uh, what we think of as the minority is perhaps the majority or the idea that the niche is the whole. So I think sometimes there's an assumption that if we plan like a city for women, or if we plan around the elderly or disabled people or queer families or recent immigrants that we're planning for a minority and that we're focusing on a niche. But what I want to suggest that is that when you take all of those so-called minorities together, that they are actually the majority. And that this thing that we have been thinking of as the majority, like a white middle-class family, cis, able-bodied, heterosexual, like that might actually be the minority at this point. So we know, for example, that, you know, a really large percentage of the population has some form of a disability. We know that in most um, so-called developed countries, our population is aging. So let's stop thinking about designing for these different groups as kind of a niche project and actually think of it as that is the majority project. That is the, that is the center, not the margin, right? So bring the margin to the center. Thank you, Bell Hooks. Uh, my second point, home is not what we think it is, right? And again, this is very clearly illustrated, at, especially at the beginning of the pandemic with isolation and lockdown, where uh, again, it seemed like for some people, the realization that home is not a safe space for everybody, that home is, um, that not everybody has a home, right? That home is not a place where many people can work and live and take care of children at the same time. So really showing, I think, a lot of uh, very class and race biased assumptions about what home is and the ways in which we think about the kinds of homes that we want to provide as you know, city planners and so on really needs like a profound shaking up uh, around this idea that home is not what we have thought it was for, for so long. Third point. Yeah, people have bodies, right? Again, something that seems to have been forgotten maybe in a lot of planning, but that is coming to the fore in this moment. And just from stories like, um, you know, people going to public parks and having nowhere to go to the bathroom. So we're being told socialize outside, go to public space, do this sort of thing. And yet there's no toilets. And suddenly people are saying, oh yeah, why don't we have any public toilets? Um, again, people have been talking about this for a long time, but nobody has paid attention. So when we're thinking about new ways of using public space, of kind of turning some of the outside inside and vice versa, we have to keep in mind the very real messy embodied reality of a city for people and not just people who are workers who are just moving in linear ways from one place to the next, but that people who have needs for sitting and rest and shelter and shade and food and toilets and care and again, maybe instead of those being extras that we add on to the places that we design, the buildings that we make, maybe that is the center and not something um, that we add on at the end. My final point here, I'll just say it, uh, you know, we can argue about this, I guess, maybe some people would argue about this, but I think care work is the economy, or at least that there is no separation really between care work and what we have come to call the economy, which has all sorts of assumptions behind it, just that language that what, that what counts as the economy is this so-called uh, public world of work. It's our restaurants and bars apparently is the economy. When we know that when we pull that or we shake up that piece of around care work, when we pull that out, when we don't support it properly, both in terms of 
a redistribution of that labor and in terms of paying people to do that labor well and so on, then we kind of, things really can uh, collapse at that point. So for me, this is not just about uh, a kind of redistribution within the home. So yes, I showed that slide about, you know, men not still doing their, their full share of um, childcare work and so on in the home, but we can't rely on just sort of individualizing this problem and telling people to kind of like, telling men to man up, I guess, and, and change more diapers, because this to me is a broader question, right? We don't wanna just bring this back to a set of solutions that are essentially based around the private family and again, a, an assumption about what the family is and what the home is. So we have to think about ways of redistributing care labor in, in um, a much wider way in, so that we are thinking about all sorts of different family forms. So it doesn't make sense to talk about redistribution of care labor in the home for single parents, for example. We also wanna think about queer families. We wanna think about families of um, essential workers, people who simply don't have the kind of freedom to like rejuggle who's gonna do the dishes and who's gonna get the kids to school and so on. So we have to think about what are the public solutions to that and maybe what also are the sorts of spatial solutions to that. So how can we create spaces for care? Now, this is where, again, I make a confession, right? I'm not a planner or an architect. In fact, I'm barely a geographer. My degrees are in women's and gender studies. So I come to this from a very particular and somewhat outsider set of angles. So all I can offer are some provocations for people who may have more direct influence over these sorts of things. But what are some first steps, right? What are the ways in which those who have the will and the power to do so can think about these problems in different ways? So one would be, first of all, recognizing what already exists in terms of uh, different sorts of care networks, recognizing what is already there that is outside of what we call the economy, right? Or what we call care work in the home and, and realizing that there's like a whole kind of in-between world where people do all sorts of things for one another that are somewhat outside of even, you know, capitalism and that involve all kinds of other social networks. So we don't have to reinvent everything from the ground up. There's a lot of people already doing this sort of work. Uh, we also have to make it intersectional, right? And not just sort of replace one dominant group with another slightly less dominant group and, and think about how the city will work for them. But the benefit of this to me though, is that actually some of the spatial solutions that work for one group of people can actually be quite good for many groups of people. So it's not that intersectionality makes us, uh, kind of locks us into a position where we are again only serving the needs of one very narrow group of people, but actually when we kind of design from the needs of the most marginalized, for example, we end up serving a really wide variety of needs, I think. So an intersectional analysis should not be something that we maybe add on at the end if we have time, but we can start there and see where that takes us. Uh, supporting care networks, not care boxes. And what I mean by care boxes is like the home, right? Or the single family home. So we want to think about how can we set up our cities, our transportation networks, our spaces within cities, our social services, our linkages and so on, such that care becomes networked and distributed and not focused within uh, the very problematic single family home. So leading to the next point, let's just like blow up the home and the family, right? And I, I guess I don't totally mean that literally, but what I mean is more blow up our ideas about what the home and the family is. And it was so exciting to hear Anna speak, but also kind of um, like frustrating because you think, oh, all of these ideas have been around for so long and we've lost sight of so many different ways of making homes or even the idea that homes could be flexible spaces. So that to me is like both hopeful and frustrating, but maybe mostly hopeful. And then finally, I would say, you know, giving communities control. So what works for one neighborhood might not work for another neighborhood and different groups of people need to feel ownership over the kinds of spaces, networks, buildings and so on that um, people might design for them.
So as I said, you know, is there anything new here? In many ways, I don't think so. And yet the COVID crisis seems to have led many people to simply be discovering things for the first time, like that domestic violence is a problem, that unpaid care work is not a sustainable way of setting up our economy, that there is still a gender division of labor and that there's underpaid service work being done by racialized and otherwise marginalized people in our society. And to me, this is you know, why we cannot aim to go back to normal because normal was really kind of messed up, quite frankly. So going back to normal is not really an option. The fact that some people seem to be hearing about or discovering or just thinking about some of these things for the first time in their lives um, says really, to me, it says a lot about how power works, right? Power works to kind of hide all of the things that are existing to support your power and privilege. And when some of those um, curtains get peeled back and you can suddenly see all of the things that have been set up to make your life easier at the expense of others, um, hopefully we don't just pull the curtains back over that. So many people might be quote unquote discovering these things for the first time, but my hope is that we can make sure that they don't forget them and have to rediscover them again in, in the future.